Um, so we're really looking forward to the next few days. We got uh, just a ton of really interesting speakers, a ton of topics. I counted over 20-something different technologies we're going to be talking about. Uh, just a few logistical things. So one is we decided to run a little bit of an experiment here. We're going to talk tonight about uh, anti-aging medications. And it turns out that if you starve people, they uh, don't age near as, as long. So we decided to try to go without lunch today and see what happens and see if you all live longer and healthier. Uh, but if you get hungry, the reason we picked this hotel is it has these great snack shacks that are just across the way there that have any kind of junk food as well as a few healthy things you'd want that are open uh, non-stop for you to go in. You just need to have your badge and you can go in there and eat whatever you want whenever you want. Um, and then, we'll, of course, we'll have a full dinner tonight. We, we were going to start a little bit later, but because of another conference going on at the hotel, they asked us to move it an hour earlier, and so that sort of put us all off. But hopefully you're not going to starve to death, and there's a lot of junk food, at least, out there. Um, uh, just a couple other logistical things. There's a map out there where, where things are. There's a free Wi-Fi, and here's the, uh, the, the login information. Um, uh, Lauren, do you know if, if you're not in this room, does that still work, or do you have to go somewhere else? Okay, so it should work for all the meeting rooms. If you don't know, that's Lauren Burkhardt, who's the director of our center, who's done all the uh, terrific organizing work along with Deb Ralph. And uh, they, they and their uh, some student helpers out there are there to help you at any time if, if you need any assistance for anything. So um, this is, as I said, the fourth time we've done this conference. We're going to do it every year. Uh, we've got already the ones scheduled for next year. And, and the, the theme of it is pretty simple, is that there, we have all these different technologies coming into our society these days. Uh, and they raise a really complex set of issues in terms of governance and ethics and law and so on. And um, there's a lot to be learned looking across these technologies, a lot of common themes, a lot of learning that can occur. So that's sort of the idea, is to bring people working on a lot of different things from different disciplines, from different parts of the world, on different technologies, and try to learn from each other and get to know each other of, of what can we learn from each other's work. And so that's really the goal of this conference. Um, and with that, uh, it really leads me into our keynote opening speaker because this is going directly to that point of that we have all these issues and they tend to be more complex than just safety or efficacy or things like that that our current uh, government looks at. And so our uh, keynote speaker today is uh, Mildred Solomon, who is the uh, CEO and president of the Hastings Center. And most of you know the Hastings Center is probably the preeminent bioethics uh, institute, certainly in the United States, maybe in the world. Uh, and Millie is a chair of that, the CEO of that, and heads that up in, in in New York where they are doing a lot of really interesting things and uh, really I think growing into this emerging technology space I've been there a couple times recently uh, on things involving emerging technologies that they're doing a lot of work on. Um, uh, Dr. Solomon's got a long history of work as a bioethicist and as a, a social science researcher and, and in terms of ethics education uh, particularly in things of health care and um, uh, terminal illness and things like that. Uh, she's also a clinical professor of anesthesiology at the Harvard Medical School where she uh, directs her fellowship in medical ethics and actually has to leave right after her talk to get to Harvard today uh, to speak uh, there tomorrow morning uh, for their graduation. So we're delighted to have uh, uh, Dr. Solomon here as not only a sponsor but as our opening keynote speaker to talk on the topic of Safety and beyond safety, seeking the wise use of emerging technologies. So Dr. Solomon, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. I really appreciate um, Gary Marchant and the program committee inviting me to um, share some remarks with you today. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I want to talk about how inescapable, difficult, and yet essential it is to talk about human values, about our various notions of the good when we're making decisions about the governance of emerging technologies. Now, as Professor Marchant just said, most of our regulatory agencies focus on safety, and even there, um, in a discussion of physical harms and safety issues, values play a very important role. Um, that's because reasonable people differ in how much weight they give to different values. Say, like, you know, adventure, how adventuresome they might want to be, and how comfortable they are 
talking about various risk to benefit ratios. Some people are very adventurous and highly comfortable with a steep risk to benefit ratio. Others, not so much. I don't know if you can see her face, but um, if that were large enough, it would represent the way I would look if I was parachuting. So that's so we've got values even in the safety conversation. But what I really want to talk about are values that are at stake that go well beyond safety and physical harm concerns. These beyond safety concerns are much harder to define, they're harder to quantify, and they're harder to talk about. And as I started to think about how I could broach this subject, I thought I might begin with what I've known best. And I promise you I will make a connection to other kinds of emerging technologies. But I want to start where I sort of entered this. Over the last 30 years, I've been, I hate to say that, I've been um, re focused on trying to re do research and to educate clinicians and the public about the wise use of life-sustaining medical technologies near the end of life. These technologies include ventilators and, and dialysis machines and more recent um, devices like left ventricular assist devices that are used for patients with severe cardiac disease. Now, obviously, they bring enormous benefits, but they've also been called halfway technologies because they cannot, often cannot, restore us to health. And um, they sometimes don't even um, achieve a quality of life that patients would value. And too often, in our health system, which is so disorganized, they are used in a routine rote way that simply um, extends the dying experience. So the easiest way I want to explain uh, what I mean by beyond safety concerns is to tell you a story about a young man who came up to me after I was giving a talk like this. Um, I'm going to call him Brian. He nearly accosted me. Um, and I remember his, his bright blue eyes. He was really alert and concerned. And he actually grabbed my arm after I spoke. And he said, you mean they didn't need to do that to her? He was talking about his grandmother. I'm going to call her Mrs. Barnett. She had just had a stroke. Um, she had some cognitive deficits, but she seemed to be able to be enjoying life. She could talk in short phrases. And when Brian and his parents went to visit her in the nursing home, she recognized them, and she seemed to be OK. But then she suffered a second stroke, and she was left without the ability to speak or swallow. And so a feeding tube was introduced. She had a feeding tube placed. And ultimately, Brian told me a tale of decreasing capacity and increasing dementia, fear, and unhappiness. She got pneumonia several times, and each time she was sent to the hospital for intravenous antibiotics, she got much more agitated with each transfer, which is very common in the elderly. As the weeks went by, his grandmother became conscious less and less, but when she was awake, she would look at him and just shake her head no. And he became convinced, and his parents agreed with him, that these trips back and forth to the hospital were a form of torture. And they asked the nursing home not to send her there anymore, to do comfort measures only, and that if she should develop a pneumonia again, that she be allowed to succumb to it. The nursing home administrators were appalled, and they refused. And then it got even worse, because her kidneys began to fail. And even though she was unconscious almost all the time, the nursing home sent her repeatedly for dialysis. Now, the concerns that Brian and his parents had were not safety concerns. It's true that she got interventions that brought harm and that you could classify her care as a medical error. But it wasn't the safety issues that were, that were agitating Brian years after his grandmother had died that caused him to come up to me that day. There were other values at stake beyond safety. There was a dignitary harm. Something was lost because the healthcare providers saw only Mrs. Barnett's organ systems, not her personhood. 
So many of us have worked for decades in the healthcare system to try to redress this kind of problem. And we've used governance strategies, both soft and hard. So patients now, 30 years into this governance evolution, have um, the right, patients have the right that are reinforced by law and by ethics guidelines, and also by a critical Supreme Court decision, to reinforce that patients have the right to refuse all manner of, of life-sustaining technologies. And unfortunately, there are still some nursing homes today that might give a family like Brian's the same kind of experience, but they would have very, very weak grounds to stand on. So I think we've made progress. And what I'd like to do is to draw a few lessons from this very distinctively different context of governance to talk about what it might teach us or might, might speak to us about the kinds of governance issues we face today. So the first lesson I'm drawing from this is simply that it helps us talk about what I mean by beyond safety concerns. Um, in the end of life care context, beyond safety concerns include values like human dignity, respect for persons, treating people as whole persons with a life history and meaningful relationships that should be honored, a commitment to talking about what's really happening if death is near, rather than consigning people to silence and not creating an opportunity for families to discuss and prepare. So that's one, it's just a very helpful device to talk about what I, what, what's meant by this phrase. The other way I wanna use this example is to take a look at what it took to build this governance framework. Now, it's still in evolution, not everything around the use of life supports near the end of life is, is settled, but there's been an awful lot of progress made. And the interesting thing is, how did that progress come about? And my short answer is that it's interesting that it began with the public, um, with families, like Karen Ann Quinlan's family, who demanded a more nuanced way to use these technologies. Karen Ann Quinlan was in a persistent vegetative state in an irreversible coma, and her parents didn't believe she would have wanted to have been maintained like that. So they asked her physicians to remove the ventilator. So the first impetus for governance came from public, and in this case, families. At that time, no one, least of all her doctors, knew whether disconnecting the ventilator would constitute a killing. So as the family initiated this, others, especially experts, came into play. And I put examples of some of those up on the slide. Um, these are what David Rothman called strangers at the bedside, like bioethicists and lawyers, trying to figure out, would it be a killing, and how do we make some guidelines here? Um, eventually, um, researchers, policy makers, I don't want to forget funders, because funders were actually critical. There was an enormous source of funding for the policy makers and researchers to be thinking about these issues. Ultimately, guidelines were developed, one set by a special presidential commission, another set by the Hastings Center. And it was helpful that there were parallel efforts that were independent but established a consensus that, that was very validating, that there were two very different sources that converged to say roughly the same thing. So the only point I want to make here is that it took a lot of players converging over a long period of time, including experts and the public. And at the end of my remarks, I'm going to be emphasizing the importance of that combination of experts and public input. So those are a couple of the lessons that uh, enable, or experiences that I wanted to make comparison with that um, can help us think about some of the important um, issues in beyond safety concerns. But this analogy may also be helpful for how different it is. Basically, the governance structure that was created in the United States was based on autonomy. Our way of governing these technologies has been to protect patient and family choice and to preserve the highly personal nature of these decisions. It's an autonomy-driven governance structure. Indeed, two patients who are in very similar medical conditions can choose radically different paths and radically different ways to use the existing op technical options near the end of life. That kind of governance structure based on autonomy serves end-of-life care very well but I believe it's going to be inadequate 
for the assessment of many of today's emerging technologies. Today, advances in genomics, in reproductive technologies, in synthetic biology, in neuroscience, in nanotechnology, in artificial intelligence, and in the ways in which these fields are converging are creating technologies that, of course, affect individuals, yes, but they also will have enormous collective impact. They are going to impact our collective future. And so I don't think that autonomy-based solutions alone are going to suffice. And so what I'm going to do next is give three examples of where there are non-safety concerns in emerging technologies. There are both safety and non-safety concerns, and where I don't believe that autonomy-based solutions will be, um, significant, will be enough. Um, the three examples are gene editing, artificial intelligence, and life extension technology. So I'm going to start with gene, with, um, gene editing. Now, of course, we've been doing genetic engineering for a very long time. That's not new. But CRISPR-Cas9 is game-changing um, because it so radically simplifies and also reduces the cost of, of changing genomes. Of course, CRISPR e e evokes safety concerns, and the National Academies has a, a committee that's working on those issues right now. But it also evokes non-safety concerns. And it does this, in, we've had them all along, but it does this with a new urgency. Questions like, to what extent should gene modification be used not just to prevent or cure disease, but to enhance the human species? And so I have this transhumanism slide simply to say that, you know, some people see the quest for enhancement as a quest to perfect the species and something that is a noble thing to do. Other commentators worry about overmastery or hubris. Um, it raises the question of when enhancement is a good or a folly to follow. One of the sets of concerns has to do with the impact on the parent-child bond. Will a child created to fit the desires of a parent be treated more as an object to be crafted than as a gift to be nurtured in its own ways? Michael Sandel has written very beautifully on this. Now, some of these decisions, in my view, should rightly stay in the private realm. I think we should want to give parents a great deal of discretion. We live in a democracy, we live in a pluralistic society, and I think that we should, for the most part, try to give as much personal discretion as we can over these kinds of questions. However, we should also go in with eyes wide open. Individual decisions, when they're made by millions of people, can have a huge impact on the population as a whole. So I know, we're, I know that we're a long way off from knowing what, if any, genetic predictors are going to predict, for example, socially stigmatized conditions, say, like, or traits, complex traits like homosexuality. But if we someday did have that knowledge, and we, were, we did say only autonomy, only parents can make these decisions, we could ultimately under, take on uh, changes that were eugenic in nature and change the prevalence of traits in the human population. So I know we're very far from that, but we have this technology now. Um, and I think that because we have the technology, this is the right time to start asking these kinds of questions. So we need to talk about these things. In the end, I don't think they're all just personal decisions that get made in the private realm, but we need to have some kind of public spaces like this to talk about them. Gene editing also raises questions, um, both safety and non-safety, about the human relationship to nature. How can we make the most, the wisest choices about stewarding our planet? For many people, an important value is that humans live in harmony with nature, not in dominion over it. But advances in molecular biology and gene editing are offering new, unprecedented levels of human control over plants and other animals. So for example, so-called de-extinction, we're on the cusp of engineering animals that will, still, that will closely resemble species that are now extinct. And conversely, we have the technical capacity not only to bring back 
um, extinct animals or things close to them, but also to do away with. When CRISPR technology is combined with gene drives, we can eradicate whole species. People are talking about um, eradicating the mosquito that is the vector for Zika, but some have even suggested eradicating all, all mosquitoes. So obviously, um, there are questions about the impact that might ha have on, the eco on ecosystems, safety questions, but it also raises more profound non-safety questions about what is the proper relationship between humans and nature. My third example, I'm showing you too soon. Um, this one is from artificial intelligence, example from artificial intelligence. Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and Stuart Russell, and many others have been expressing concern that we've been making pro so much progress in AI that it's conceivable one day artificial intelligence might surpass human intelligence. And this is what the slide was for. DeepMind's AlphaGo recently beat the world master. This isn't the world master. He's just standing in for that. Um, so, and, and the worry isn't just, as this picture shows, that it might be disheartening. <laughs> Rather, the worry is that someday we may not be able to control AI, it might control us. Now, we recently held a meeting on artificial intelligence that was convened by Wendell Wallach on this question. The primary question was, will AI be safe and controllable? But it was very obvious through the course of the meeting that um, there's a variety of non-safety issues as well. Advances in artificial intelligence, as I've learned from Wendell so much of this, are creating vast networks of smart software that are collecting big data and drawing inferences, and in many cases, making decisions about numerous aspects of our lives, from making buy-sell decisions on the stock market to um, air traffic control and to the control of our power grids. So safety, um, as Wendell's pointed out in A Dangerous Master, is a big concern because an error in one system can trigger cascade effects in other systems. But there are also other kinds of concerns. We should expect technological unemployment. How's that going to go? Perhaps we'll be released from drudgery and humanity can turn to nobler, more pleasant pursuits. Maybe we'll be turned into sloths who are entertained by cheap pleasures. Who knows which way that will go? Or it could even be that um, without meaningful work, we could become, um, instead of using our time, leisure time in a more productive way, we would be, this is going to sound very familiar, tied to our gadgets, which some of us are already addicted to, speaking for myself. So it's really uncertain what's going to happen, and there should be a conversation about how we help it move in directions that we're comfortable with. Many less skillful jobs are clearly going to be eliminated. It's expected, for example, that Google's self-driving cars are going to eliminate the trucking industry. What values are going to guide how we handle that? You know, will we compensate people who have lost their jobs and provide them with ample ways to find meaning and purpose in their lives? Another area in artificial intelligence is robotics. It's very exciting to imagine how the next generation of service robots may improve our lives. This, this slide shows a robotic waitress. <clears throat> and it's, I don't know if you can read it, it's very pale, but it says Robo Server 3000. But I think at this rate, we are probably going to be offered a Coke by a robot well before the year 3000. Um, Already, companion robots are becoming very important for dealing with the frail, el frail elders. And I do look forward to their help in helping families who are currently overwhelmed with caregiving burdens. So I think that robots can play a very important part in companion, in companion in service to the frail and the elder. Already in Japan, there's been great investment in this direction. So, Robots are not only getting smarter, they are also looking more human. They have very impressive abilities to see and interpret visual and auditory information. We could begin treating robots like they're human, infusing them with feelings and intentions, and conversely, achieving a simulacrum of affection for ourselves. Already, people are working on lifelike robots capable of being sexual partners. 
In short, we will need to consider how we can best benefit from impressive gains in AI without the downsides that could come with that. And some of the non-safety questions that will be raised that we will need to grapple with include privacy, which does get, is something I think we tend to talk a lot about, but also control, deception, authenticity, and the extent of our moral responsibility as a society to the, to the humans whose labor is going to be displaced. So now to my third example, life extension. This is right down the street in Scottsdale. It's the Elcor Foundation. Now, as I told you at the beginning, I have spent a lot of my life focused on improving end-of-life care and trying to convince people that death is a natural part of life. But apparently, I've been tilting at windmills, at least according to some people, um, who, um, who, for example, have paid quite a lot to have their bodies stored in these canisters. The tall canisters are for whole body storage, and the short canisters or if you would like to preserve some of your estate's assets and pay less money, you can just preserve your head. So I'm not going to use my time with you to say why I disagree with the notion that immortality is a good thing. Um, certainly there are many people advocating for life extension technologies and even hoping for a sense of immortality. I'm not going to argue the ethics of that right now. I basically want to use this example simply to say how once you open these beyond safety concerns and start to talk about your notions of human flourishing and what is the good, it gets very contentious. And this is a good example for that because in one of these canisters is Ted Williams, the Boston Red Sox baseball legend. But he's only there after a hugely terrible uh, family fight because his family couldn't decide what he would have wanted. So these issues are really diverse. And for that reason, it's really not surprising that they are usually off the table in most public and governmental deliberations. In fact, they're expressly not the part of some of our regulatory bodies' charges. For example, the, Fed um, the, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, by mandate, only looks at safety and efficacy. And even national ethics commissions, where you would think this is exactly where these issues would be taken up, rarely take these issues up. And with one important exception, most presidential ethics commissions have focused either on safety or they do also look at issues of fairness because they want to be sure that everybody has access to the benefits of, it, of the technology they're looking at. Professor Marchant has proposed some ways that we might add attention to these beyond safety concerns. He's proposed that various government agencies be required to do ethics impact statements akin to environmental impact statements. And he's also proposed ethics review boards that would be attached to evaluating specific agency proposals that have values dimensions. I think those ideas are very worthwhile and need to be explored. My message this afternoon is that we need to do a lot more in many domains, in government, in quasi-governmental structures, and in um, non-governmental strategies for exploring the social and ethical implications. And I'm going, the last part of my talk is going to focus on who should be involved in those conversations and how, how can we start, who should we start to engage with. Um, and I'm going to talk about three kinds of audiences, scientists, social scientists, humanists, and other scholars like bioethicists who've been trained in normative analysis, and the public. Now let me talk about scientists first. Scientists obviously are on the front line of discovery, so they're well positioned to identify these issues. And certainly, it's been scientists who have been first to express safety concerns. For example, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking on the AI concerns that I talked about. In the area of genetic engineering, Asilomar stands as an example of scientist-initiated inquiry. And it was Jennifer Dudna herself who called for the recent moratorium uh, to consider the wisdom of editing the human germline. Both Asilomar and the recent CRISPR summit 
have been criticized, I realize that, for taking up too narrow a set of considerations and for being comprised primarily of scientists. And la therefore, they've been criticized for lacking in public input. Ben Hurlbut here at ASU did a really wonderful piece that was published in the Hastings Center report on criticizing exactly that. So I take, his, I take his criticism. I think this is a very important point, and you'll see I'm going to come back to it at the end. Nevertheless, I think scientists are a key group that should be initiating ethical inquiry too often when they have the focus has only been on safety. And I think that there's a way to that we can move this, advance this, by integrating ethics education into the preparation of scientists. In 2013, I testified to the President's Commission on Bioethical Issues about ways to do that, ways to start preparing scientists to ask these broader range of value questions. And I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit about that in the Q&A. <clears throat> Now, another group who should be taking up non-safety ethical issues are, of course, the people who already are. Um, bioethicists and others trained to consider values questions, so sociologists, anthropologists, people who are um, trained in science and technology studies. All of these disciplines look critically at the emergence of technology and their likely impact. And I think we should own and recognize the special training that is important that brings a special, a special lens. Um, all of these disciplines have important contributions to make and we sometimes, I don't know, we ourselves uh, understate the importance of the training and the, and the kinds of lenses that we bring. But also others often um, don't, see that our don't see our methods, they're not obvious to people who haven't been trained in them and sometimes don't even recognize our expertise. So for example, Steven Pinker, psychologist at Harvard, who was writing about CRISPR-Cas9, I know you can't read this, but I'm gonna tell you what he, the, the, the basic line was five words. He said in this op-ed piece in the Boston Globe, when, when Jennifer Doudna um, herself was calling for a moratorium, when the scientists themselves were calling for a moratorium, Pinker told what circled there to bioethicist, quote, get out of the way. So his article, painted all bioethicists with one stroke as though we were a unitary group and, unitar and uniformly obstructionist. But anyone who knows the field knows that there are analysts of all stripes who have many different views on the same issue. To Pinker's point, I'll grant Pinker's point, that sometimes bioethicists or social scientists or humanists with critical eyes on a problem might slow down the advance of a technology, hopefully for good reasons. But I also want to underscore the reverse. At other times, ethics review can quell unfounded public fears and offer reasons why a technology should advance. So I see bioethics and others who are writing about science and technology occupying a pivotal position, um, as I say, sometimes slowing things down and sometimes um, providing um, clarity when public fears are unfounded or, or when vested interests might not want something to proceed for a poor reason. So ideally, given these very different skill sets of scientists, social scientists, and ethicists, I, I hope we can continue to find ways to work together in transdisciplinary teams. There's a wonderful example here at ASU where anthropologist Gaiman Bennett has been embedded working with uh, synthetic biology researchers. At the Hastings Center, we've had an embedded anthropologist too. Sarah McGraw has been embedded at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute where she's worked alongside bench scientists who are doing genome sequencing of cancer tumors. I think we need more models like that that are very transdisciplinary. Um, but even all that will not be enough. The third category on that slide I showed you a minute ago was the public. There have to be ways in a democracy for the public, and really that's plural, various publics, to express their views about what kinds of technologies we should be developing, where we should be investing our resources, and how to shape and perhaps sometimes limit applications. So I think this is one of the hardest things, and I don't have a, you know, a, a silver bullet. It's, there, I think there are two kind, very different kinds of challenges when we talk about public engagement. 
One are a set of conceptual challenges, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then there are really practical challenges about how to do this and how to scale it. So conceptually first, as, we've been, as I've been trying to demonstrate through the examples I've been giving, these issues bring up profound questions about meaning, purpose, and the nature of the good life. These are deeply personal questions, and they often engage religious perspectives. In liberal democracies, we believe that individuals should be free to pursue their own conceptions of the good. So typically in the United States, we try to keep religious concerns in the private realm. We do so because we're a pluralistic society, and we've wanted, or at least historically, we've wanted to uh, allow many different conceptions to flourish. We're obviously at a moment in time where one could begin to question that. But we also tend to keep considerations of these value questions in the private realm for another reason, which is that once you open the Pandora's box, multiple ideas of the good come flying out, and that causes a great deal of conflict. So it's also a conflict avoidance strategy. In the end, though, I think we just have to find a way to talk about these issues. And there's some good news here. The good news is that views on these technologies do not necessarily split along traditional progressive conservative lines. They do in some ways, it's complicated, but there's an opening here because not, they don't perfectly align in that way. So progressives who are, there are progressives who feel some concerns about technologies and some political conservatives who, who do also, and there's just not, it's not a one-for-one one alignment. So I think that's good. That creates an opening for us to talk across political lines. Um, and also, I don't think we need to shy away from discussions just because they do engage deeply held religious views. We need not be afraid of that if we can find a way to talk about our religious views in secular language. And I think almost always when people think about why do you hold that belief, you can begin to talk about these things in non-religious terms that gives an opportunity for them to be discussed. So there's a lot of conceptual problems. That's what I was trying to flag with those comments. Then there's a lot of practical problems, which is just what's the best way to do this? Um, I know that there's some very exciting work going on on how to design and carry out and also evaluate various forms of uh, democratic deliberation. Dan Sarowitz, for example, brought attention in the piece that I recently read. He brought attention to the Worldwide Views Alliance, which is coordinated by the Danish Board of Technology. Um, so they've been doing this since 2009. Here, there are just some snapshots that are from a few of the countries, Pakistan, Japan, Haiti, and Arizona, you're not a country. Um, like <laughs> I know, I know. I've just, I've just elevated you. So, you know, this is a very interesting model, and they they do this in multiple cities with hundreds of people at a time. So, in a given day, they can involve thousands of people. Other approach, approaches include, for example, ECAST, which stands for Expert and Citizen Assessment of Science and Technology, which NASA has formed, which includes both experts and the public to. Um, think about how to handle asteroid detection, which was a big story in the New York Times today. Other models, Susan Dorr um, Gould of Michigan State and Jennifer Kuzma of North Carolina State have been doing a lot of really rigorous study of how to do democratic deliberation. Michael Guzmano from the Hastings Center is going to be on a panel tomorrow afternoon that's going to also talk about um, democratic deliberation. So, these are very promising initiatives, but there's a lot of questions about how to do it well and how to scale it. And I think this is going to be particularly difficult in the US context because, let's face it, we have dismal rates of scientific literacy, and we have a very strong current of anti-intellectualism. So as we think more seriously about how to mount effective forms of public deliberation, I think we need at the same time to be educating the next generation in scientific literacy and ethics literacy and building uh, an ethic of tolerance and respect for diversity. My colleagues, um, including uh, Josephine Johnston, 
and I have been spending a lot of effort trying to build such literacies and promoting tolerance for different viewpoints about major ethical issues regarding emerging technologies with high school students. And I think these goals are really worthwhile. I'd be happy to talk about what we've been doing at the secondary school level in the Q&A. I think we should be doing things like that at the doctoral level as well. The bottom line is that we need public engagement, but it's awfully hard to figure out how to do it in a meaningful way. And I think we're going to need a combination of efforts, effective and feasible forms of democratic deliberation, secondary college and postgraduate education, and then maybe most importantly of all, discussion of these issues in the public square through popular culture, in the arts, through novels, movies, and television. When you think about where change has really worked most effectively, the times that we've had a real public square kind of conversation about which direction our society should go in, the discussion has always, to be successful, gone beyond scholarly elites. And it's always found a way to enter public awareness. That's true of women's rights. It's true of civil rights. And it's even becoming true in my own area of end-of-life care, thankfully. Um, I think it's in part because end-of-life care issues are now in television shows, in movies and novels. More and more people are beginning to realize that more technology near the end of life is not always for the best. And I think we are having progress in all these areas because we've begun to be able to explain that there are deep human values at stake. Brian's grandmother, I want to return to her as I just close. Um, I talked with you about her at the start. She didn't have a good use of technology. She didn't have a good death. She received technologies just because they were there, not because they were fulfilling needs or offering her any meaning to her life. But if we're willing to talk about these deep non-safety human value questions that matter to us and to share our hopes and visions for what our collective future will be, then I think we can do a better job for our children and our grandchildren than Brian's grandmother had. Leave it there.